Hello everyone and welcome to my weekly Coyotes chat. It's 2 p.m. on Wednesday so that means it's time to talk some Coyotes hockey. Uh, they're in the midst of a three-game road trip through Canada. Uh, the Coyotes beat the Oilers last night 6-2, to two, really started to look like they got their game a little bit in order. Um, big offensive performance though, five players had multi-point games with uh, Mikhail Bodker and Mike Ribeiro leading the way, both had three points. Um, so tonight the, the road trip continues, the Coyotes are in Calgary for an 8 o'clock puck drop against the Flames, so we look forward to following along the action tonight. But let's get the, this chat started and take our first question. It comes from Jack. Will the Coyotes ever use their old Kachina style uniforms for a game or two in the future? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think it'd be something that would be very conducive to a throwback or, um, you know, looking back to, you know, the past. If they have every type of night like that where they celebrate, um, you know, a throwback jersey or, you know, an anniversary type game. But I haven't heard of any concrete plans, but I'm sure it's something that the new ownership group is exploring and, and might act actually execute in the future. I know those were popular among some fans, so it would probably be cool to see them back for a game or two um, sometime in the future. Okay, our next question is from Chris Hamill, and Chris asks, do we know when McCulloch is coming back? Um, you know, it's it's been really kind of hard to on McCulloch's status. We, we haven't seen him around the rink too often. Um, the last, if you'll remember, he got injured in the November 14th game in Chicago against the Blackhawks, left with a lower body injury, and most, recent, most recently a week ago was placed on injured reserve so that the Coyotes could actually call up some help. Um, the good news right now is that he is on this road trip with the team. Uh, he didn't make the road trip last week, and that was really a sign of him not being ready to go at all. But the fact that he's here, he started to skate, is a very good sign. Dave Tippett didn't sound too optimistic that we would see him during this road trip. He really wasn't sure if he'd play um, in Calgary tonight or in Vancouver on Friday. So I think if everything continues to progress the way it is, I think it's probably very possible that we see him maybe sometime next week. The Coyotes play in Denver on Tuesday against the Colorado Avalanche, and then they're back home for games Thursday and Saturday. So maybe one of those two games are more real target but it's obviously clear they miss him they miss his contributions he's the kind of defender that they have missed in these last few weeks when they've really tried to work on their defending game very stable matchup guy who blocks a lot of shots and he'll really be a big boost to the lineup when he's able to return so I think possibly next week with a few more days off this weekend might be a more realistic target for a Zabinik Mahalik return okay our next question comes from Grant Lyon. Hey Grant, are the Coyotes going to start giving Thomas Grice a little bit more of a look in net? Um, I think as we get deeper into this December schedule we're going to see Thomas Grice a little more. The Coyotes do kind of have it mapped out so far, the starts that they'd like to give Grice, but obviously that can change on a game-by-game -game basis. They really don't, you know, definitely you know, say you're the guy tonight because something could happen injury-wise. Mike Smith could go on a great run and they don't want to stop him, but if you look like to last week, Wednesday's start in Minnesota um, was an assigned start for Rice. So they're starting to pick their days to try and give Smith a little rest, but also work Rice in because he's 3-0 in the games he started. He's really done well in the opportunity he's been given. I think it's very possible we see him tonight in Calgary against the Flames. It's a back-to-back, -back, and they have another game Friday in Vancouver, another important division game against a team that's closer to them in the standings. So it makes sense that they'd want to give Mike Smith that game, but it's hard to not want to go to Grice every once in a while. He hasn't done anything to prove that they can't rely on him. And it'll really be interesting to see his progression this season. I think he's a guy who's kind of on that bubble of clamoring for a number one job. He's on a one-year contract with the Coyotes, so it'll be interesting to see after this season if his body of work continues to trend in the direction that it has so far. If someone gives him an opportunity to get more of a workload and you know progress to a number one because he's a great guy in the room, Teammates really enjoy him. Very easygoing guy, not the kind of quirky goalie personality that you'd expect. And his performance so far is, has spoken for itself. Okay, next question. Another goalie question. This one again from Jack. Is it me or does Mike Smith seem to feed off the team in front of him? Last night seemed like a perfect example. 
Um, yeah, like Smith definitely was better last night, and I think it is because the performance in front of him was better as well. Um, you know, I was able to talk to Mike before this road trip started, and he really said, you know, what had been bothering his play lately was his mental approach. He felt like tactically he was doing, you know, he was doing everything fine in the net, but he was putting too much pressure on himself to really deliver the perfect A game. Um, to try and pull the Coyotes out of this, you know, stretch that they've been going in. And I think when he just simplified his game last night and really just tried to let pucks hit him, basically that was it. He didn't want to have to go out and make the big save unless it was needed. And I think we saw that last night. Like Jack said, the team in batter was front of him, and he really feeds off that because I think he gets more confidence knowing I don't have to make the save of my life right here. The guys in front of me are playing well. They're backing me up. And we saw that only two goals, which was, which was good for the Coyotes to kind of get back a little bit. Obviously, they had the offensive explosion with six, um, so that, you know, it could have been a little bit closer. But it was a step in the right direction, and I think that was important for Mike to see that, to kind of know that, okay, if I alleviate this pressure, just play, just kind of react, and like you said, feed off the guys in front of me. It really makes for a better effort for the entire team. So I think that'll be something, though, to continue to watch. Um, you know, Smith's performance, his mental approach. He's still looking for a shutout, which is kind of bizarre um, since he's usually been near the top of the league the last few years in that category. So, um, you know, he's trying to get those numbers down, the goals against, the save percentage, get that up. Um, and a performance like last night certainly will help him accomplish that. Okay, our next question is from Newfie 1963 Overall this season, do you think the officiating is favoriting the Yotes opponents? Most of the Yotes penalties are legit, but the opponents seem to get away with more. Hansel was slashed in front of the net last night and cross-checked by the Hawks on Saturday with no calls. I, I kind of agree with that they missed some of those calls. I really like, um, Nufi mentioned, the, the call against Chicago was very blatant. Hansel was battling in front of the net, got a shot off, and then Steve Brook kind of just cross-checked, whacked him, and Hansel retaliated, which he admitted after the game he shouldn't have done. But the refs, like the saying says, you know, they always get the retaliation. That's the call they never miss. And it's unfortunate. I think sometimes there have been a few games this season where Tippett and the Coyotes haven't been so impressed with, with the officiating calls. But they've never been one to blame it on that. There's always been larger issues at play that have led to the loss or led to the goal. Um, you know, they can't put themselves... Uh, on a five-on-three penalty kill situation like they did Saturday against the Blackhawks, you know, within the first two minutes of the game, there's a too many men penalty, and then Derek Morris gets called for holding. So those are situations they feel that they can control. But as far as Hansel, I, you know, I think officials are starting to recognize that um, he's been suspended a couple times. He's a big body. He plays a rough and gruff type of game, and so I, I think they're you know paying more attention to him and what he does. Um, and he goes into those areas that, you know, penalties get called in front of the net, along the boards. And so I think he's garnering a reputation that he's got to be careful. And I think that's why we're seeing maybe more calls against him. But you can't fault him for the job that he's doing. He's scoring. He's finding ways to really be effective. And many would argue he's been, the, you know, an offensive MVP so far this season. So it's kind of a catch-22, but it's something that the Coyotes can control as best as they can what they can control. And obviously, you know, it's human error. There's going to be mistakes and calls that they just don't agree with. Okay, our next question comes from Robert E. Lee. Any plans for arena renovations or additions or anything like that in the near future? I haven't heard of anything in the near, near future. I know the ownership group was interested, though, and, in, you know, trying to maybe bring more attractions in, you know, to the arena. I know the idea of bringing a Tim Hortons coffee chain into the arena has been thrown around. Um, I'm not sure that that has made any progress, but little things like that, um, you know, to maybe help uh, the fan experience. But really, I mean, this arena is, is 10 years old. Um, um, you know, I still think that they that they think it's in good condition, um, but I haven't heard of anything concrete. But it could be something to watch still as we get older and the arena ages. But um, you know, for right now, I know that it's regarded as one of the nicer buildings in in the arena in the league, rather. And um, you know, from visiting reporters, they love the press box. It's a great setup. So um, something to monitor, I think, as the arena ages. But for right now, it seems like everything is is kind of kosher with where the arena is at so far. 
Okay, and this is our last question of the day it's from Hamad. I don't under understand why no team took a chance on Klesla. The Islanders, for example, they really need help on D, and surely Klesla could have been in their top six. Why do you think no team was willing to pick up Klesla? Uh, I, I think it was uh, a couple of reasons why Klesla might have been difficult um, for other teams to pick up. I think, first of all, which you know hurt maybe his, his time with the Coyotes so far this season, is he's been injury-prone this season. And he started with a concussion after getting hit in the preseason by um, Jordan Nolan of the LA Kings. He came back, played a few weeks, and then was injured again in LA, had to leave that game with a lower body injury. And so I think teams were a little cautious to try and add a player in who's already missed a chunk of games this season because of injury. And then you factor in because of these injuries, his conditioning and, and you know game conditioning wasn't maybe where it needs to be. And if a team like the Islanders, like Hamad mentioned, who are looking to solidify their top six, they want a guy who can come in, be a minute eater, settle in, and really stabilize their group. They really don't want to bring in someone who has issues, um, you know, that could be sitting on their bench and on their shelf. So I think that was part of it. The other factor too um, was his salary, and it, you know, just under a three million dollar salary and cap it um, is tough because a lot of teams right now are at that ceiling, at that limit, and so to take something, they have to give something. Thing away, and so um, you know, a trade might have been more viable. But then again, it goes back to those other issues: is he healthy? Is he conditioning? Is he really going to help our group? And I think a lot of teams were a little bit cautious with that. Um, you know, obviously, this is the first time that Klesla in his career has been to the AHL. It shows you, you know, the type of stock that he's had in in, in the league so far in his career, and. You know, he went to Portland, he reported he's going to get a lot of work in in a very compact schedule, which, which the Coyotes like. So possibly we see him back in a Coyotes uniform this season, maybe sooner than later. Um, but maybe he does get an opportunity elsewhere. Um, you know, in his early 30s, his career, I, I believe, by no means is over. But, you know, I think it was just kind of a choppy start to this season. Not a lot of stability with injuries and, and playing time. And, and hopefully, you know, for Klesla's sake, and his family he's able to rectify that and, and get back to the NHL so thank you for taking the time to join our chat today we'll be back at uh, the same time next week um, for our weekly Coyotes chat make sure to follow me on Twitter at EZC underscore McClellan for more Coyotes inside and updates and you also find links to my stories on our AZ Central Sports brand account at AZC Sports um, so follow that for all your Coyotes news and we'll see you next week